Hello and welcome to For Your Health. I'm Mark Crosby of Quincy Access Television. Thank you for joining us. For Your Health is a program that looks at various health issues and uh, concerns and helps you to stay healthy and informed. Uh, today we have, uh, as in programs past, Caitlin Pico. She is a public health nurse coordinator here in the city of Quincy. And uh, the topic is actually one that um, has been in the news quite a bit recently, and that is RSV. So to talk uh, and to find out more about RSV, I'm going to turn to my guest now, Caitlin, uh, Nurse Caitlin Pico. Welcome back. Thank you for having me as always. Great to have you as always. This um, particular condition, which I will have you give out its full name, has been in the news a lot. Yeah, so um, we'll be discussing respiratory sensital virus. Um, this is a virus that's kind of similar to a flu-like virus as well. Um, a couple things that could differ from it, but um, definitely I'll go through symptoms and how to prevent this. And we should look at the outline. I should look at the outline. So, <laughs> and then we'll go forward. So we're going to take a look at uh, what will be discussed on today's program. We will start with a definition, which is always a good way to start. We will talk about symptoms, transmission, high-risk individuals, infants and children, caring for someone with RSV, and prevention. So, definition. Yes, yeah, so according to the CDC, RSV is a common respiratory virus that typically will cause um, mild cold-like symptoms. Um, so typically, if a person were to be exposed, they would, um, or excuse me, not exposed, but if they were to develop RSV, um, they would typically get sick and recover in one to two weeks. Um, but for high-risk individuals, which I'll go into um, the list that is covered on the CDC, um, there can be some serious complications, which is why, of course, we are seeing on the news all these hospitalizations um, for high-risk individuals. So I just wanted to quickly mention some serious complications that you might get um, is bronchitis and then also pneumonia. So that's either inflammation of the small airways in the lungs or an infection within your lungs completely. And then um, just one other thing is this activity, like the cold, um, kind of similar to COVID as well. Um, I know COVID's year round, but we do see RSV activity in the U.S. Um, typically begin in the fall and this goes through the spring. I think what's making this maybe more complicated to diagnose is that um, at the time that we're recording this program, we are talking about um, COVID. COVID yes. is still out there, COVID-19, and the seasonal flu. Yes. So we have the seasonal flu, COVID, RSV. So there's a lot of respiratory viruses that are circulating right now. I um, mean, as you will see when I go through these symptoms, they mimic each other so closely. Um, so it's very important to, especially if yourself or your child is high risk, that you really keep in contact with your doctor to make sure um, they can keep an eye and make sure you don't get seriously ill. And we should also mention that we are recording this program, I would say mid-January. And because of this and the others that I just mentioned, yeah. medications, over-the-counter medications, are being, I, I guess they're just hard to come by. Yes, um, especially like a couple weeks ago, it was big that um, pediatric medications were very hard to come by. So you would really want to make sure you're, again, staying in close contact with your pediatrician. Um, a lot of facilities, they'll kind of do their best to know where medications are. If they're writing a prescription, they'll try to send it to a pharmacy they know can fill it. Um, but they were, I was just in a consult actually, um, and there was a pediatric doctor there. And they were saying um, some things that might help is even teaming up with your community. Like, I know on Facebook, there are a lot of groups where people are writing in saying, I found 
t uh, pediatric Tylenol at this CVS at this time. So you really want to work with others, help others. Um, if you have extra and you can spare some, but it's nice to do. Um, but one big thing that was mentioned is you want to make sure you're, if you can't find that medicine, you're contacting your doctor um, so they're aware of it and maybe they can suggest something else as well. And um, when we get down to treating, caring for someone with RSV, I'll go over some other measures besides medication that could help. Sounds good. Let's look at uh, symptoms. And as I mentioned, these symptoms, these symptoms could indicate something else. Yes. As well. So I guess um, take just keep that in mind as um, we discuss these. Cough, fever, runny nose, sneezing, decreased appetite, wheezing. Yeah, so those are some typical symptoms of RSV. Um, these symptoms typically appear four to six days following your exposure to it. And then symptoms, again, can, um, they should only last a week or two, and it's really just taking, there's no medicine or cure for this, so it's really just making sure you're managing your symptoms at home, um, or if need be, you're calling 911 or going to the hospital if necessary. And I guess just keeping track of the timeline, right? So yes. you know that, okay, I would expect to be sick from here to here, but not from here to here as far as yes. length of, uh, I suppose, length of the illness. Yes, and I've actually found that like quite often, especially with COVID, um, it's a good idea if you're feeling sick, keep a journal and keep track of what your symptoms are. Because right now, he calls in the health department, people will call and they'll be diagnosed with COVID and they're like, well, I've been coughing for six months. So it's kind of, Keep track of your symptoms if you can. Um, but it is also very important to note that very young infants that may get RSV, um, they may not have those symptoms before mentioned. They might only exhibit um, irritability, decreased activity, and difficulty breathing. So you really want to make sure you're keeping a close eye on your child. And these symptoms typically appear four to six days following getting infected. Yes, yes, that's the typical. And symptoms normally appear gradually, not all at once. So as I'm mentioning all of these, don't expect all of these to hit at the same time. Yes, and also you might not, if an individual is diagnosed, they might not hit every single one of these. Of course, people's bodies respond a little differently sometimes, but these are the general symptoms we have seen with RSV. And when we heard about RSV, at least in the news, wasn't it the children that were mentioned first? Yeah, so we'll go into that um, in a couple, in a little bit, but basically children, uh, especially premature children or um, children born with heart conditions or lung conditions, they're really high risk um, and their body doesn't have a lot of immunity against this, of course. So it's very important to keep them safe and as a parent to make sure you're not bringing them around sick kids and, or sick individuals as a whole um, and that you're really just monitoring them to make sure, especially during these peak seasons, that they're not developing these symptoms. Right. So play dates are fun, but they're fun with healthy yes. children. Yes. Let's talk about uh, transmission. Yeah, so um, RSV is spread through droplets. So this is when an infected person um, coughs or sneezes. You can also see this if um, somebody kisses a child's face. I feel like that's a very common practice that my, I Because against. they're so adorable. Right? Yes, but it's hard. <laughs> you really don't want to kiss somebody else's baby because you're putting that child at risk and really the only, but person that's benefiting from kissing that baby is yourself. So leave that to the parents. Don't kiss anybody else's baby. You don't want to get them sick and you don't want the guilt of getting them sick. Certainly. Um, so yes, kissing is one as well. Um, it can also be spread through surfaces. So this can live, survive on hard surfaces. So if you're thinking um, doorknobs, tables, crib rails, um, one thing that people don't think of how dirty it is is your cell phone. 
If you're out all day, out and about, you're carrying that and you're touching it at all times, you're not always washing your hands before. So something to keep in mind, especially during the season, um, make sure you're washing your phone and you're not, because you're exposing yourself to viruses that may live on it. Um, so it can live for several hours on those hard surfaces. And then it can also um, live on soft surfaces, such as blankets, tissues. That's a much shorter period of time oh, okay. that it would survive. But the biggest takeaway is, the, um, and I think COVID had kind of brought this about, is don't touch your face. If you're out and about, don't touch your face, because the second you don't know what your hands have been touching, what was there before. The second you touch your eyes, your mouth, your nose, you're letting all that bacteria and viruses enter your body. I like it that you spoke specifically of the areas of the face that um, basically are avenues for germs to get into your body. Yes. So your nose, your mouth, your eyes. Yeah, so those are the biggest, um, those are very easily accessible for viruses and bacteria to get in but you could also if you had a cut on your arm or a wound like it can get into that portal as well so and you know and I think that that's just simply a very it could be a hard thing to manage because I, I guess if I looked at the amount of times I touch my face in the course of a day I think it's a lot Yes. Right. Going into the beginning of the pandemic, I'm like, I do this so often. I'm surprised. Right. Maybe that's why I had a good immune system at that point. Well, that, that's true, too. I guess the more you're exposed, yeah. provided it's not uh, an exposure to something that does some permanent damage. Yes. But the more you're exposed to viruses, the better your immune system, the, the stronger your immune yes. system becomes. Because it will build a defense system against it. Right. Um, Saying that, I don't want anybody going out and trying to expose themselves by any means. Um, I won't touch my face twice as yes. much now just because of yes. that. Yes, but biggest thing, and I, we say this almost every episode we do, is hand washing. Make sure you're washing those hands with soap and water. Right, and doing it for a period of time, not just turning on the faucet yes. and two seconds later turning it off. So you really need to uh, create some suds, yep. and uh, you need to sing two choruses of happy birthday. Yes two courses a happy birthday that's always a good one and that's easy for even teaching children that's a really easy and fun thing for them to do if they're singing there like washing your hands isn't fun but when their song comes into it maybe they'll like to do it right so. absolutely let's look at high risk individuals yeah so um there are several groups that are considered at high risk for severe disease um so to begin with we have premature infants and this is um, a baby that is born before 35 weeks. Um, so if you think of a premature baby, they have underdeveloped lungs and their respiratory system is not fully developed yet. Um, and unlike full-term babies, they have fewer, fewer antibodies transferred from their mother. So it's very hard for premature babies to fight off infection. So that's um, one very high risk group. Again, please don't kiss any babies. <laughs> um, and then other children, so young children with congenital heart or chronic lung disease. Just for anyone that doesn't know at home, congenital just means from birth. Um, so that means they were just born with that condition. And then also we have young children who are have compromised immune systems or weakened immune systems um, that may have a different medical condition or be on treatment for a medical condition that could lower their immunity. Um, we also have children with neuromuscular disorders. And then we have, this is the same thing, but now gearing towards adults, adults with compromised immune systems um, in older adults that may have underlying health conditions including heart or lung disease. Now as we age our bodies change right so yeah. your anyone's ability to fight something later in life may be harder because of that correct? Yeah so your immunity kind of like once 
as you age, your immunity does decline. Um, so that's even with doses, vaccines, seniors may have a higher dose in hopes that their immune system will react to. Um, and it's kind and of... And that's just aging. That's just that's the aging, just aging process. That's just aging, yes. Um, so that is why you will see like adult 65 and older should get a higher dose flu vaccine. Um, so it goes the same. So your immunity to any virus just kind of goes down in time. Your body can't fight it off quite as well. That's something to look forward to. Yes. Let's, yes. let's look uh, specifically now at infants and children. Yes. So although adults are affected as well, um, children are of course very big in the news for this there are a lot of the individuals taking up hospital beds of course um, so according to the CDC virtually all children will get affected with RSV by the time they turn two years old um, and it's an estimated that 58,000 to 80,000 children under the age of five years old will be hospitalized for RSV infection each year so that is a very high amount of children. Um, and as before mentioned, with RSV, the biggest severe complications we have are the bronchiolitis, um, inflammation of the small airways, and then pneumonia, inflammation of the lungs. Um, and I just wanted to mention that these children that are hospitalized, where there is no cure, um, a lot of these hospitalizations is more supportive care, so they may be given nasal oxygen, they may have IV fluids to help manage their hydration, um, and in um, pretty severe situations you might have to go on mechanical ventilation. Um, but according to the CDC, um, typically with those symptomatic care, those measures that are being used to treat your symptoms, typically kids recover and they're discharged from the hospital in a couple of days or a week. So typically we are seeing a lot of children being able to fight it, which is good. Um, and I also just wanted to mention that there, although again there's no vaccine currently and there's no cure, um, healthcare providers may um, order a medication as a preventative measure. Um, it's called polizumab. Um, in this medication, it's an injection, and it's only given to young children that are considered at very high risk for severe disease, such as your premature infants, um, your congenital heart disease or lung disease. And so I just wanted to mention that if you have a child at home and they have one of these conditions and you're very you're fearful, of course, um, you could definitely talk to your child's health care provider and that might be a medication they may want to give to help prevent the severity of RSV. It won't prevent it from getting it, but it could hopefully make it not as severe. I'm going to put a time date stamp on this program uh, again uh, because what I'm about to say is news that just broke within the past uh, 24 hours, and that yeah. uh, is that Moderna is working on a vaccine, and I guess it, the trials that they have uh, been conducting yes. have been promising. Of course, it still needs to, it has to be submitted first to the Food and Drug Administration. Yeah, so um, they are waiting. So th I was reviewing that information. So it looks like Moderna has a vaccine for um, a, the adult population. I believe, I don't have the exact number, but I think it was 83% effective. Right. Um, and yes, they were going to be bringing that forward. They said the beginning of 2023, they will be bringing that to the FDA for approval. So that would be great. Um, I know there are a lot of vaccines, especially with COVID out here. People are being told left and right about different vaccines they need. But I do think high risk, that would be amazing because it could probably prevent a lot of illness. Do you find working in the field that um, the number of vaccines that are out and of course the COVID boosters, uh, the COVID shots mm -hmm. and then the COVID boosters, that uh, people are tiring of vaccines? So 
I definitely, it, it's hard to say just working in my one location at the health department, um, but I do believe vaccine fatigue is a thing. Um, there's only, people are, they're being told left and right, you need this, you need this, you need that. So people are kind of getting hesitant to do it. Um, some of our clinics have slowed down, but that's also not taking into account a lot of the individuals that do come to clinics at our facility already have them. Um, but I definitely have seen that and noticed it, and hopefully with education and getting the word out there, people will protect themselves and do the right thing for themselves. Right, and for others. And for others, yes. Let's talk about caring for someone with RSV. Yeah, so um, I know I've said this four times now, but again, there's no current treatment for it. Um, and hopefully people will resolve in one to two weeks. So some measures you can do, whether it's for yourself or for a child, um, you want to manage symptoms at home, including your fever and pain, um, using over-the-counter medications such as Tylenol, or Motrin. Um, I want to say definitely never give a child aspirin. Um, I know with a lot of the shortages out there, parents have been doing their best and going to several stores and finding what they can. Don't give your child something before you consult with your doctor, especially um, like if it is a child's Tylenol but you have an infant at home possibly could be okay to give to use that medication but call your health care provider your child's um, primary doctor because they will actually give you those exact measurements also a pharmacist would be able to help you just want to make sure you're being safe and you're not just giving your child something just to give it to them um, so it's real those doctors the pediatricians out there they're working very hard and they're very knowledgeable. So I would definitely consult with them. Um, and another thing you could do, you want to make sure you're staying hydrated. So drink, um, make sure you're drinking fluids. Um, a lot of, especially if you're sick in a situation like this, um, I know when I was a young child, when I was sick, I would refuse to drink anything it's or eat hard. anything. It's hard. My mom would, I it wouldn't be till I was in the ER that I'd be like, I'll take a drink. <laughs> um, but uh, there's so much on the market now, like even Pedialyte, if they don't have the bottles, they do have like the to-go sticks that you put into a water bottle. And they also have Pedialyte um, popsicles, which children tend to love. And it's great because if they have a fever and they're eating that popsicle, it's going to cool them down while also providing some electrolytes. And I, I think what people need to keep in mind is that um, you can simply sip and that's fine. You don't have to gulp. You don't yes. have to drink an entire glass or half glass of water or Pedialyte. Uh, you could just have a glass and take a sip now and yes. again and you'd be okay. It's just that need to keep hydrated. Yeah, so especially when you're sick, you want to make sure you're hydrating. Um, and again, those Pedialyte pops are awesome. I still like them, and I'm 30 years old, so. <laughs> well, I think um, there was a Pedialyte commercial um, on, it's probably currently playing, where the dad was caught uh, drinking <laughs> a bottle himself, and I think the kid came around the corner and said, hey, Dad, that's mine. Yes, and they can, um, there are other brands, of course, like Pedialyte that are also effective. Um, you just really want to check that label and make sure it's not too high in sugar because um, some of the sports drinks that offer electrolytes can be really high in sugar, so you just want to make sure you're balancing that out. And the key word is electrolytes because you wouldn't get that from water. Yes, that is, there's, plain water has no electrolytes. So um, it definitely, those electrolytes will just help your body, especially if you are in a dehydrated state, it will help your body absorb the fluid. But if water was the only thing around, certainly drink water. Absolutely, yes. Let's talk about uh, prevention. We talked about um, washing your hands often. We talked about uh, two choruses or two verses, I guess, of happy birthday. Yes. So you have your hand washing. Um, 
these are, and some of these are really typical things that we've been told for years, of course. Um, but make sure you're covering your mouth when or nose when you're coughing or sneezing. And I want to stop you there for a second because um, maybe we're coming up to it. Um, well, I just should have let you finish, but don't sneeze into your hands. I mean, you're covering your mouth. Don't cough into your hands. It's always best to use a sleeve. Yes, it's best to use your sleeve because if you're coughing right into your hands and you touch stuff, you're going to spread it to everybody else. So if you were to cough into your sleeve, it's a better, because then, the, yes, the germs are there, but you're going to go home and wash that. So it's not, you're not putting it, others at risk. Whereas if I'm just sneezing into the open, it would just spread to everybody around me. Right. And if I sneeze into my arm, there's less of a chance of me actually transmitting it from my arm to a doorknob Correct. or to a table. Yes. Yes. Avoid close contact with anyone that is sick. Yes, yeah, so avoid close contact. Um, also stay home if you're not feeling well. And it can be really hard, especially I know the holidays just passed. Um, but think of all the events that we go to, birthday parties, dinners, just different things. I know it's really hard to feel left out and we've just gone through a pandemic which was very lonely for so many. But you really just want to keep in mind if you're not feeling good and you just don't know what it is, maybe take a COVID test, a flu, like talk to a doctor if you need to. You're better off finding out what you may have rather than going and exposing all your family and friends. And you don't want to be the one that spreads yes. an illness to anyone. Yes, and it's very hard, of course, um, the time we're living right now, there is some, people are feeling sick all the time right now. So I understand it's very hard. You just want to be as safe as you can. Um, possibly if you can't miss the event, maybe even throw a mask on and just let others know so if they're not comfortable, they can keep their distance from you. And we have just a couple of minutes left. Avoid touching your face. We talked about that. Yep with unwashed hands and then clean and disinfect surfaces. Yes, and that again is your uh, doorknobs, your toys, and again that cell phone. It's dirty, so make sure you're washing it. <laughs> when, you, when you said I've got um, a device to talk about or something else to talk about, I wasn't thinking of the cell phone, but yes. clearly w we all walk around with, with it so often that mm -hmm. um, it's even more of a spreader than let's say the regular corded house phone. Yes, because yeah, at home it was really just your phone on the hook, but in your home in your safe space, but you're out and about, you're touching everything around you. And the phone is always with you now. And your phone's always with you, so that's just a thing to keep in mind. Very to clean. good. Well, there's a lot of things to keep in mind from yes. this program, but I want to thank you uh, for talking about RSV and uh, certainly uh, welcome you back uh, on a different day with a different topic. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And thank you at home for watching. We want to thank all the access centers across the country that do pick up this program. And we uh, ask you, we hope that you do uh, remain safe and healthy. Take care.